party begins, don't you? Yes. <laughs> I think it's fun when parties begin. Maybe we need more of that. Um, I, I don't want to necessarily begin the sermon with parties, but I want to begin with pigeons. Okay? And actually a specific kind of pigeon. Uh, homing pigeons, or more commonly known as carrier pigeons, are the breed of pigeon that is able to fly from anywhere on the face of the earth to their home. They have this incredible way of discovering where their home is and, and what they can do to get home. It's just an amazing kind of thing. Now these pigeons uh, have been trained through the years because of the instinct that is a part of them to actually carry messages uh, you know, attached to their leg from one location to another. They've been trained to fly from their nest to their feeding port, which might be hundreds of miles away. And then when they're released again, they're able to fly back home to their nests. It's just an incredible bird with this, this innate sense of knowing what direction to go and when to go there. As I said, they, they can fly up to several hundred miles. They can fly at 55 miles an hour. They are very accurate in getting home. Storms usually don't lock them off course. It's just an amazing thing to watch these. Back in the 1800s, uh, they were used, homing pigeons were used a lot to carry messages, especially from the outer islands uh, back into the main land. <coughs> and even during World War I, they were used to send reports from the battlefield back to headquarters. Uh, just an amazing kind of a thing. Long before there was ever wireless radio, the homing pigeons delivered the news. Uh, today they are used in the sport of pigeon racing. They have this uncanny way of finding their way back home no matter where in the world they are released. And scientists have yet to figure out what it is about the homing pigeon that gives them such a precise and accurate uh, honing in on their nests. Uh, most other pigeons do not have anything near that capability, but the homing pigeon can sure figure out how to find its way home, more so than any other animal on the face of the earth. Now I mentioned this because we human beings have a kind of sense of homing also, and the ability to, um, to uh, we can't we can't find our way home when we're lost. We don't have the capability like the homing pigeon does. That's why we've invented maps and GPSs. But we do have within us a capability to home in on something that no other creature does. We humans seek the home of our Heavenly Father, of God. Uh, I mentioned last week that Max Lucado has written a book entitled God's Story, Your Story. And in his book, he mentions this. He says, what God gave pigeons, he gave you. A guidance system. You were born heaven equipped with a hunger for your heavenly home. Need proof? Consider your questions. You ask questions about death and time about significance and relevance. Animals don't seem to ask those kinds of questions. You know, dogs howl at the moon, but we stare at it and we ask, how did we get here? What are we here for? Are we someone's idea or just something of a mistake? Why on earth are we here on this earth? Let me ask you this, where do these stirrings come from? Who put those kinds of thoughts inside our heads? Why can't we just be like pigeons, happy with bird seed and reproduction? I mean, why can't we just be like pigeons? Well, the answer is because according to Jesus, we aren't home yet. I'm preaching this sermon series right now with the simple theme, God is close. And I think one of the great examples that helps us come to understand that God chooses to be close to us, to get close to us, to, to become a part of who we are in our daily walk, is that we have this longing within our souls for something more, something bigger than ourselves, 
something that is more meaningful. I believe that those feelings have been placed inside us by God so that we can get a sense of just how much God cares for us. We have these abilities to reflect upon life and problems and blessings because there is a God who wants us to know that this earth is not our home. He ultimately has a much better place for us. He wants us to know that we will never feel fully comfortable here on earth because this is not our final destination. We have a home beyond the confines of this earthly life and that is what we subconsciously yearn for. We are the only reflective and thoughtful animal on the face of the earth. Now, many scientists believe that we have evolved into the most developed of all creatures because we have what's called the opposing thumb. You know what that means? That, that means that our thumb opposes our fingers. Now, most other animals don't have that. And, and because of that, we're able to grab hold of tools and build things. And in the process of doing that, scientists say we have evolved and, and matured in the animal kingdom much more than most other animals. But that's not the case. We have developed far beyond all other creatures on the face of the earth because God has placed within us the ability to reflect and ponder upon the great questions of life. We are that way because God wants us to relate and, and reflect upon the bigger picture or the bigger goal that he has placed within us. And no other animal has that ability. Now, while all animals have some kind of ability to remember, most animals live by instinct. For example, I enjoy fishing, although I don't do it very much anymore. But when I was learning how to fish, I learned that most fish have a very short memory, only maybe 10 or 15 minutes long. And that gives us, the fishermen, the opportunity to, let's say, we're fishing over here in, in this area of the lake for a while, and we're fishing pretty intensely in this area of the lake, and we're catching fish out of this particular area of the lake, and maybe we've even hooked on a fish that then wiggles itself and frees itself from our hook and goes swimming away. So we fish this area for a while, then we come over and we decide we're gonna fish this part of the lake now, but 20, 25, 30 minutes later, we can return to this area of the lake and fish it again, and maybe even catch that fish that we hooked just a half hour earlier. Why? Because that fish has forgotten that we were there. And now we have him in the boat. A bass or a snook isn't going to sit back and reflect upon the hook. They are not going to say, gee, I thought that they shake that hook off. Gee, what was that all about? They're not going to, to say, what is that guy up there in that dark thing? Why is he trying to ruin my day? <laughs> They're not going to ask the question, what deep thing should I learn the next time one of those hooks comes flying past my mouth? They're not going to ask those kind of questions. They're not going to ask, hey, here I am in the water, but I see something up there, a big glowing ball. And should, should I worship something like that? Catfish don't ask those kinds of questions. She is home in the water and never has any thoughts about eternity. But we do. Because we are god breathe and destined for a greater life beyond the one that we are living now. My sermon title is God is close. You are halfway home. One thing that Jesus taught us as he walked upon the face of the earth, close and personal. Remember, Jesus gets close and personal was that we have a future and a home with God that far outlives the expectations that we have down here on. Jesus encourages us to look forward to that place. He wants us to look beyond the confines and the troubles of this life and look at a more eternal home. 
Jesus spoke these words in John chapter 14. Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. He said, I, I go to my father's house where there is much room, enough room for all of us. And when I go, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when I am done preparing that place, I am going to return and take you with me to that place so that where I am, you may be also. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus encourages us with these words. See first the kingdom of God. Why? Because that is our ultimate destination. And God wants each of us to reach that. Way back in the Old Testament, it is said that the wisest man in the Old Testament was a man named King Solomon. And King Solomon wrote in the book of Ecclesiastes these words. God has planted eternity in the human heart. God has planted your yearning for eternity in your human heart. God loves us so much that he wants us to be sure that we know that eternity is out there just waiting for us. The story of the prodigal son is a classic retelling of the story of a father who wants so badly for his son to return home. And that's the story that Joy and I sharing with you today. The story is really titled incorrectly. Perhaps instead of being called the parable of the prodigal son, it should be titled the parable of the yearning father. Because the story is really about a father who is so very eager to embrace his lost son and to forgive him for his sins. Every one of us could easily be a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter. But most of us find it hard to be the forgiving, yearning father. But it's not hard for God. Over and over again, he seeks to make the point that he wants nothing more than to get us home, to be home with him. I want you to notice something. I want you to notice how the scripture passage begins. As Joanna stood up here and began to read the scripture, she said this. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them a story. To illustrate the point further. What is the point that Jesus was trying to illustrate further? Well, in order for us to know that, we need to step back in the Bible a few paragraphs and read some of the other stuff, which includes two other stories. There's a story in there about a lost sheep. And there's a story in there about a lost coin. Do you remember the story of the lost sheep? A shepherd has 100 sheep, and he's counting them. He counts them out several times a day, and he discovers that one of his sheep is missing. So he leaves the other 99 behind, and this shepherd goes diligently looking for the lost sheep until he finds it. He doesn't give up until he finds it. And the scripture says when he finds it, he puts the sheep up on his shoulders, and he turns home to all the other shepherds, and he celebrates. That sheep that was lost is now found. The story of the lost coin is of a woman who discovers that one of her coins, the family income, has has been lost. And so it says she sweeps the entire house. She cleans the house. She lifts up all of the mattresses. She goes looking for this coin everywhere, under pots and pans, you know, the kids' homework, wherever they, she might look. She looks until she finds that coin. And then the scripture says she gets so excited about it, she goes outside and she holds it up and she celebrates with her neighbors that that coin that was lost is now found. In each of those stories, God is portrayed as the shepherd. God is the woman cleaning her house. God is the yearning father, yearning for his lost son. The stories are really about God going out of his way, doing everything possible to draw humanity into its ultimate goal, which is to save the lost, so that we may live with him in all of eternity. Do you see God's point in those stories? Do you see yourself headed for home, for God's home in that way? Because he so wants to embrace you. Let me illustrate the point a little bit more personally. 
And to start out with, let me say this. I love my job. And I love all of you also. I mean, I just really appreciate my job, and I appreciate you folks. But I need to tell you something. The best part of my day is not hanging around with you guys. <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, I mean, just think about it. Uh, for example, some of you just love having meetings. And there's meetings going on all the time at the church. And for some reason or another, you want me to be a big part of those meetings. And I hate meetings. Now, many of you want me not just to be the pastor of the church, but also the facilities manager. And as a facilities manager, I'm the one who has to worry about getting the elevator fixed or getting the church bus fixed, which was a like, call I got last night at 9 o'clock up in Tennessee. The bus won't start. Or, or picking out what color the new refrigerator is going to be. Like, that's supposed to be my job. I'm the one who has to make all of those decisions. And, and then you folks want to hear from me the best sermon you have ever heard. And you want that week after week after week. This job, it's hard work. So let me say it again. While I love my job, and I appreciate each and every one of you, and I will go out of my way to visit you at the hospital or to help take care of your needs, trust me, the best part of my day is not hanging out with you. <laughs> the best part of my day is when I get in the car. And I start to drive home. It's on my way home. Because at home, I know that I have a loving wife that is waiting for me. It is at home that I know that I can sit down at the, at the kitchen table to this wonderful home-prepared meal that Peggy picked up at Little Caesars. <laughs> I know it is at home that I can kick off my shoes and just be myself and crash on my couch and watch Pawn Star. <laughs> it's the place I know I can go to rest. My best part of the day is home. Well, here's another way to look at that. I think it's a little bit more profound. It's a video. Let's watch it.
than in the loving arms of your Father, God.